Thank you, Madam President. I rise today as I have every year that I've been in the Senate, which is a, quite a long time now, the last 10 years going into 11, to give some remarks in commemoration of Black History Month. And the way that I've done that, and the way that our office has done it, is to recognize a special figure in my home state of Pennsylvania, an individual that we're very proud of. Today, we honor Dr. Constance E. Clayton, a trailblazing figure whose career in education positively impacted the lives of countless children in Philadelphia, and whose work continues to pay dividends in the city public schools to this day. Throughout her long career as a teacher and administrator in the Philadelphia School District, Dr. Clayton never lost sight of her mission. In her words, quote, the children come first, unquote. A product of Philadelphia Public Schools, Dr. Clayton became the first African American and the first woman to serve as superintendent of the Philadelphia School District. This Black History Month, we celebrate Dr. Clayton's place in that history. But as we do, we should ask, also ask ourselves if we are living up to her legacy, if we are putting the children first, all children everywhere first. I'll be seeing Dr. Clayton today and so many of her friends. The rules don't allow me to acknowledge anyone else in the chamber, so I'll do that later. But I do want her to know how much we appreciate her giving us this much time to pay tribute to her and to her work. Connie Clayton's story is a great American story. Born to a plumber and social worker, she was raised by her mother and her grandmother after her parents divorced when she was just two years old. She attended Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Dunbar Elementary School in Philadelphia. Her mind, like so many children, was awakened by a special teacher. In her case, her fourth grade teacher at Dunbar, whose name she still readily recalls, Ms. Alice Spotwood. She remembers that Ms. Spotwood was kind and she made learning fun. She also remembers that Ms. Spotwood seemed interested in her individually, even as she was interested in every other child in that classroom. Ms. Spotwood made Connie feel special. So Connie Clayton went on to attend Jay Cook Junior High School and Philadelphia High School for Girls, where she excelled academically. She thought she wanted to be a doctor, even taking four years of Latin at girls, at girls High on the theory that she would need to decipher dated medical jar jargon. Her enthusiasm waned when she realized that calling a body a corpus didn't make studying its contents any more appealing. She chose instead to focus on the mind, earning her bachelor's degree and her master's of education from Temple University before going on to her doctorate of education, in this case in educational leadership from the University of Pennsylvania, where she was a Rockefeller scholar. Now Dr. Constance E. Clayton recognized that her, that education is, or her edu education is what empowered her to, to succeed. And it started at Dunbar, where teachers like Ms. Spotwood first taught her to raise her sights and to reach out and to believe. So it's no coincidence that her first step in her professional life was to go back to Dunbar and return the favor. She took a role as a student teacher alongside many of the same people who taught her before she could imagine that the letters PhD would follow her name or that the title, quote, superintendent, unquote, would someday precede it. In 1955, Dr. Clayton got her first full-time teaching job at Philadelphia's Harrison Elementary School, where she taught fifth grade social studies. Grounded in that personal mission that children come first, Dr. Clayton's years as a teacher revealed a unique gift for understanding children, their specific challenges, and their particular needs. This is no doubt why in the years that followed, she earned a role 
in developing the social studies curriculum for the entire district and led an effort to develop and train teachers to implement black history curriculum throughout the school district. Dr. Clayton recalls understanding that for students at a predominantly black school in Philadelphia, it's Black History Month every day, every month, that they need to see their, their lived experience reflected in the course material because they didn't see many white picket fences where they were growing up. To paraphrase Carter Woodson, often known as the father of black history himself, kids need to learn not just about black history, but about black people in American history. Dr. Clayton recalls the reward of watching kids excited to learn that they too could be a painter, an author, an astronaut, or whatever they wanted. Of watching the limits of those children's imaginations dissolve before their eyes. Dr. Clayton didn't limit her own imagination either. In 1972, she was named executive director and associate superintendent of early childhood education programs for the Philadelphia School District. Early childhood education is an issue dear to my own heart as a sponsor of legislation here in the Senate to earn and to ensure universal early education nationwide. We know that the stakes for this issue are high. Early learning increases future income. It reduces the chance of arrest or incarceration. And it also reduces, early learning does, reliance on social services. Under Dr. Clayton's leadership, the Philadelphia School District expanded and enhanced its early education program into a national model. Connie Clayton's passion for helping children and her, her competence did not go unnoticed. And in 1982, she was chosen as superintendent of the Philadelphia School District, the first African American and the first woman to hold that role. She knew the, express, the expectation would be high, but her mother always told her, quote, delete the word can't from your vocabulary, unquote. So Connie hit the ground running hard, declaring in the press conference where she accepted the job that her motto that would come to define her tenure, quote, the children come first, unquote. I've often said that there's a light inside of every child, and it's the obligation of adults, especially elected officials, to make sure that that line, light shines brightly, to make, it, that it, make sure that it shines to the full measure of its potential. We know that from day one as superintendent, Dr. Connie Clayton knew her job was to nurture this light, but as a product of segregated education herself, she understood that our system doesn't always allow every light to shine equally bright. High minority schools re often receive less funding, often have less experienced teachers, often offer fewer high-level math and science courses. And we know still today that this is true. Black K through 12 students are, off, are almost four times as likely as white students to receive an out of school suspension and almost twice as likely to be expelled. Black students represent 16% of the public school population today, but 42% of the population of justice facility education programs. Connie Clayton refused to simply curse the darkness of these numbers. She worked to change them. She knew that an enlightened mind can empower students to overcome the traps laid by cynicism, indifference, and underfunding, to slip the bounds of low expectation and beat the odds, and then turn around and work to change them. A good education to, can take that light inside and make it flare. So she might have asked, and we still ask, what then is a good education? Can some combination of facts and numbers alone contain this transformative power, the power of education? Well, W.E. Du Bois said, quote, education must not simply teach work, it must teach life, unquote. Dr. Clayton understood that in this in all of its implications, both clear 
and subtle. She knew it's clear that a good education starts with an open school. In the five years preceding Dr. Clayton's term as superintendent, there were five teacher strikes in Philadelphia that cost students a thousand days in the classroom. But during her 11 years in office, there wasn't a single strike. She knew it's clear that a good education requires funding. When she came in, the Philadelphia School District was facing a crushing $90 million deficit, deficit. When she left, it was running a surplus and she had created financial partnerships with area businesses, all without closing a single school. Dr. Clayton knew it's clear that a good education comes from a good curriculum. When she came in, she noticed the school district had stopped teaching algebra. When she left as superintendent, she had fostered a partnership with local university professors to teach the subject algebra to a volunteer class that grew from nine kids the first year to over 1,900. She implemented a free breakfast program because she knew that students from certain parts of the district might not be able to get food in the morning, and we know, as she knew well, that hungry kids cannot learn. She reinstated summer school because she knew that a few credits here or there can mean the difference between a diploma and a dropout. And, that, and in that difference lay the blueprints to divergent lives. She treated her schools like second homes for children because she remembered from all her years teaching how the vast majority of parents wanted more for their kids than they were able to provide and just needed some help in filling the gaps. And she took just one week of vacation in 11 years as superintendent. That's gotta be some kind of national record. And just one, just one day of vacation in her many years of teaching before that, because she felt not just a passion for her work, but an urgency to see its results. Dr. Clayton had a sense of urgency about educating these children. In the same way it was urgent for the followers of, followers of Sojourner Truth in the 19th century. It was urgent for the students in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, known as SNCC, in the 20th century. They had that urgency. And it's, ur it's been urgent for all of the ordinary lives before, between, and since. It was urgent for little Hannah A. Lyons, a girl studying in Philadelphia in the 1830s, whose family saved her school copybook as, quote, proof that there were some educated black people back when, unquote, and donated this copybook to the recently opened National Museum of African American History and Culture here in Washington, where it sits on display. It was also urgent, of course, for Connie Clayton, Dr. Constance Clayton, when she attended segregated schools in the same city some hundred years after Hannah. And that's because a good education is not just some combination of numbers and facts. It's enlightenment for a mind constrained, freedom for a soul repressed, a passport to a future that transcends artificial limitations and unleashes potential. Dr. Clayton worked feverishly to put one of those passports in the pockets of each student who passed through the Philadelphia schools under her watch. Her passion and her vision earned her a reputation as a reformer whom the New York Times wrote led, quote, an educational renaissance, unquote, in Philadelphia. She would do whatever it took to make schools better for her students. She pushed the district to meet the goals of the America 2000 program, an ambitious plan to significantly increase the achievements of urban school districts across the country. She instituted a homeless student initiative, a successful program to provide continuity in education and a level of consistent support to the hundreds, perhaps thousands, of homeless children in the district enduring the daily hardships of life in shelters. Connie worked to desegregate schools 
and made sure the district was providing employment opportunities to minority candidates. Several years later, uh, I should say several years into her administration, the executive director of the Council of Great City Schools remarked of Dr. Clayton's tenure as superintendent. Quote, looking at an array of programs carried out in Philadelphia, you'll see almost every innovative reform that has been proposed in urban schools, unquote. So it's no surprise that Dr. Clayton received all manner of awards and honors. Let me give you a few. The Dr. Constance E. Clayton Chair in Urban Education at the Graduate School of Education at the University of Pennsylvania, which was named in her honor. The first endowed professorship in the United States to be named after an African-American woman. She received the Distinguished Daughters of Pennsylvania Award and the Humanitarian Service Award from the Philadelphia Commission on Human Relations, as well as the 2008 Star, Commitment, Star Community Commitment in Education Award from the Philadelphia Education Fund, just to name a few. She has received honorary doctorates from 17 colleges and universities, not to mention being a visiting professor at Harvard's Graduate School of Education. And I could go on and on today. She currently serves as trustee of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, chairing the African and Afro-American Collections and Exhibits Committee, and is, and is a life member of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority, where she has served in multiple leadership uh, roles. Connie Clayton's life has been a life of service, a life of service. We know that in our state capitol, a building has the following inscription, and I'm quoting, all public service is a trust given in faith and accepted in honor, unquote. Dr. Clayton honored the trust of public service. She validated the faith that the parents of all those students placed in her to carry out that trust. And she always put school children first. So on behalf of those students and their parents and everyone else, her work touched in the course of her long career. It's my distinct privilege to honor Dr. Constance E. Clayton in celebration of Black History Month on the Senate floor today. I want to convey our gratitude for her devotion to education and of course, to the children of Philadelphia.